everyone. I am not Aviad, as you can see, Aviad asked me to replace him uh, as you see. And uh, I'm uh, so happy to present uh, Yoram Shachar. Um, a few words about Yoram Shachar. He's a legal historian, studied in Tel Aviv and Oxford University, and later served as law professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Tel Aviv University, and Reichman University, where he also <coughs> served as dean. Shachar held visiting posts in various institutes, including Berkeley, University of Michigan, and the Max Planck Institute in Germany. So a uh, few words on behalf of the publishing <laughs> house of the Institute. So we're very happy to have you here with us, Yoram. It's a great moment for uh, the publishing house and for uh, the Institute. Um, a happy moment and a moment of pride um, for the book. Uh, you have the book. Uh, um, can you please pass the book? We, uh, just pass it around. And, um, it's, and it is in Hebrew, but the lecture will be held in English. Um, <laughs> so, you know, some books are here to stay with us after we're gone. Surely this book is one of these books. Some books are for months, others are for years, and others are for decades and years to come. I'm sure this is a, a book that will remain for a long time. Uh, with us, of course, I'm uh, thankful for Smarda Rothman <laughs> for her honest, honest toil, honest labor. What should I say? <laughs> Very honest. <laughs> uh, no, I was asking about the toil or labor because in at the book it says honest toil, and uh, right, uh, right. the paper, uh, the declaration of of the lecture is honest toil. Anyway, thank you, Smarda. And Ezra, is Ezra here? No. He's not, not here. I should also <laughs> thank Ezra for his uh, contribution in a contribution in ah, drafting shalom. the drafting of the declaration, or more properly said, the in, pre in the preparation of of the book and its promotion. Of course, an important book about a words that actually touch the very essence of our existence here, uh, our identity. Or identities and already I have I have questions about the book but I should keep silent as this is a uh, Yoram Shachar's show Yoram Shachar's uh, talk and uh, we'll ask you Yoram to um, uh, deliver <coughs> your, your talk uh, for about 40 minutes after which uh, we will collect uh, questions so Yoram the floor is yours thank you Thank you all very much. I'm honored and proud and happy to be here. Um, um, I also have to extend, I don't have to, I, I'm happy to extend uh, thanks to the publishing house, to the, to the institute, to the Machon as a whole, and to the publishing house, and especially to Smada Rotman and, and other um, staff, staff of the publishing house of the ben Gurion Institute for uh, a truly wonderful, wonderful work on the book, both from the, of course, the content point of view, but also, as, as you may see, they, they, um, the, the, the graphics o of the book, it's all totally wonderful, and I'm very grateful. Um, a word about language. M my book is almost exclusively on words the wording, not even the content as such, but the words of the Declaration of Independence. And the declaration was made in <laughs> Hebrew. In a moment, I'll say s something about the choice. As you, you were surprised about the Hebrew language of the book. So there was a controversy about the language of the declaration itself. But the decision was, the final decision was made to make the declaration in Hebrew and just <laughs> translate it into English. Um, and the intricacies of the Hebrew language, part of it is even archaic today. Even the Hebrew language used in the declaration is a bit archaic. So I can't even fully communicate with 
um, young members of my community, this generation doesn't even get the, the, um, <laughs> the intricate differences between, I'll say it in Hebrew, uh, the point is that non-Hebrew speakers should not <laughs> understand the difference between Hayashuv Ha'ivri or Hayashuv Ha'yehudi, being Jewish, being a Hebrew, and what is the community of founding fathers, God, founders, parents, right? What is the community of founding fathers of the state of Israel? Is, are they Hebrew? Are they Jewish? Who cares, right? So um, <coughs> adding a, um, a, 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 a problem of translation would have would have lost much of the of the meaning. Therefore, I would mainly speak about political events surrounding the Declaration of Independence, and then touch a little about <laughs> on on issues of words, content, and meaning. So, um, my first point would be about iconography, about the declaration and its depiction, the visual um, aspect of the declaration itself, all the different, as different visual, the various visual aspects of the declaration um, as icons important in the formative years of the state. <coughs> this is my first theme, nothing about, n not at all about content at this stage. So, here is a, perhaps the most iconic, can I enlarge it even further? Not important. <coughs> no, all right, sorry. Here we go. So this uh, image is probably the most famous image in the whole history of at least 75 or so years of existence of the State of Israel. It is it, it, um, the leader you see here, David McGurion, even sort of uh, was responsible in a way for um, creating a film around it, not video at the time, a real film. And the film is repeatedly presented at least every Independence Day, but on many <coughs> other occasions. The pictures hang all around um, formal institutes of state and different institutes that need to create discipline, awe, and respect. Um, it is, the sim it is a symbolic <coughs> vision of the creation of the state. Now, this is known. I think every Israeli knows the iconic um, message behind the picture itself. But the text that I depict here in its, um, Again, let me try and enlarge, all right. The text I depict here, a version of, of which is here on the table, miraculous, miraculously in English, Nathan, who is, where is Nathan, who is responsible for this, for the creation of this in English. Um, the Hebrew version is even more iconic. It is so <laughs> iconic that it creates the expected effect, which is that as in other icons or religious texts, it is not the reader or the viewer is not supposed to even read it carefully. They're supposed to accept the existence of the text and accept its holiness and its very existence let alone look behind it for the creator of the text. So let me quickly say, if you watch David Ben-Gurion here, read out, I won't try to enlarge again, it 
ending catastrophe, all right? So David Ben-Gurion is not holding any scroll. Nathan almost insisted that I treat it as a scroll, all right? This is part of the iconography of it. We, we Israelis, um, depict it, feel it as a scroll with all the, um, the meaning behind all the, yeah, the meaning behind the scrolls, <coughs> you're not supposed to open them uh, except on holy occasions, on festive <coughs> occasions. They're supposed to be at least slightly secret. What I mean by this is that the form of it as a scroll-like text was part of the propaganda, to my mind, positive propaganda, necessary propaganda at the formative stage of an immigrant society that at that stage is not yet ready to be a people. There was a need to create a people from communities of immigrants and icons were necessary at that time. So if you watch David Ben-Gurion, he reads out from a just a piece of paper, a typed piece of paper. He would change, he would, he would change pages while reading. This <coughs> is a fake. This is fake news, 75 years um, earlier. This is fake. This was created by the um, chief propagandist, visual propagandist, the graphic um, um, director of the um, Israeli iconography back in 1948. His name was Ota Valish. Um, weeks after the declaration, Ota Valish, um, the graphic expert, actually created this parchment-like or scroll-like text. And this is how most I Israelis expect to see it, including Nathan, Nathan, all right? <laughs> Natan, okay. Um, I've just received uh, um, the final approval from the state archives to the effect that the, the upper, at least the upper two pages of, as, as you may see here a bit more clearly, these are three pages that are sewn together um, here is one break, and here's another break. So there are three pages. This is one, this is the other one, and this is the, 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 the bottom page where the signatures are supposed to be. Ooh. Some, of, <laughs> some of the Israelis now went f white in the face. Are they not the signatures? All right, so I have just received an, uh, the, uh, the final approval by the state archives. These upper two pages were imitation paper, parchment paper used in Jewish um, tradition to wrap um, menorahs. Um, how, how do you say menorah? Uh, a lamp, all right. Uh, Jewish traditional lamps, Shabbat lamps are traditionally surrounded, but the light is surrounded by original, by, by real parchment. But then imitation papers were created. So Otto Valish went out to Allenby Street, where not where Steymatsky is now is, but there was something else, uh, some other shop before for office, office equipment. He bought two pieces of imitation paper and, and <laughs> scribed uh, in traditional, Scribe the text in traditional Jewish <laughs> font, traditional Jewish font, uh, holy Jewish font, font. And the question remains about the bottom page. Uh, is the bottom page parchment? Has a cow died to produce this page? Um, the, the question is still pending. I expect in the next two or three years or 200 years, uh, a, 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 an admission that this is also probably a piece of paper. Uh, truth is, if it is parchment, then it is real fake 
because there was no parchment paper on the table at the moment of signing, uh, signing out of the declaration. So if a, par if a real parchment was used later, then even the signatures are fake, but who cares? <laughs> Otto Wallis, um, uh, or perhaps other branches of government who are even more expert than him on uh, forging um, signatures may have been responsible for it, but who cares? This is useful. This is a useful, this is a useful text. It has been useful, it still is useful uh, to at least part of the population in Israel as the credo of the, uh, of the state of Israel, and it has done its work. But uh, we are historians, so we need to tell the truth. So this event happens on May 14, 1948, in Tel Aviv, in what used to be the Tel Aviv Museum, for formerly they actually the private house of the mayor of Tel Aviv, the good Mr. Dizengoff. This happened on, on the afternoon hours of Friday, 14th of May, 1948. Now the question is what led to, um, to, this, uh, uh, to this event? Let me first say this. The majority of existing states in the world have attained independent independence without a declaration or at least without a, uh, a full, fully fledged declaration of the sort that we have here in Israel. Now, part of the reason why I researched into the creation of the Declaration of Independence was to create for myself the, uh, an opportunity that is usually not available to historians, and that is counterfactuals. The beauty of it is that there were many tentative declarations of independence in the month or more precisely weeks before the event, before 14th of May, 1948. Some of them are part of a sequence that finally led to this text you see before you, but others were totally independent. They were created in different circumstances. And some of them take the form of a very laconic, um, declaration like um, good morning world the state a, a Jewish state is declared full stop that's it uh, some lawyers in the um, in a semi-formal group that um, was responsible for creating legislation for the future state, assumed that part of their task was to, to um, form a declaration of independence. Being just lawyers, they assumed that all they needed to do was to make a declaration, a speech act, mm -hmm. a, 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 a collection of words that create a state. They felt no need to uh, tell a full story of the of the Jewish people of the Jewish people and its six thousand years history and the international justification for creation of the state, let alone semi-constitutional uh, promises for the future, etc. And and calls to the nations of the world and calls to the Arabs of Israel to the minority of Israel. Some of them did not feel they, 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 um, they had to make this full declaration. Um, others went beyond the text you see here and created almost poetic epos, and a poetic epos. Uh, some of them went all the way in their religious beliefs and actually 
um, founded the establishment of the state in, in totally religious um, um, terms. So, was a declaration necessary? Not sure. But the other question is, what were the diplomatic and um, international events that led to the creation of the state? This is in part necessary to understand, to understanding this process is in part necessary to understanding some issues of the Declaration of Independence, actual in Declaration of Independence that, that I will touch shortly. So, in, on 29th of November 1947, the General Assembly of the United Nations passed a resolution, its formal number is 181, Resolution 181, for the creation of three state or state-like entities in what can be called the land of Israel or Palestine, even the names are, are <coughs> um, meaningful to, to different communities. Three different, different um, um, entities, one a Jewish state, one an Arab state, and there was supposed to be an international um, um, entity overlooking Jerusalem, the holy places, but um, this would be at least interesting to my Israeli colleagues. Jerusalem was not just what we call now Jerusalem, or not, not just a city, not even just the, the, um, the old city or the east, city, uh, east part of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was more or less what we now call Greater Jerusalem, starting from Male Edumim all the way to Kiryat Anavim. This would not mean much to our guests, but it's a, it's a large piece of land that was not supposed to be, not, e not even not the capital of the form of the future Jewish state, but not even part of the state of the Jewish state that would later call itself Israel. So three different entities, and the idea was that there will be some economic union between them, perhaps one day uh, even a political federation, but this was not part of it. At least a, an economic union between three different entities, two of them states, one Jewish, one Arab, and one international overlooking uh, 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 Jerusalem. What you see here in the, um, in the, uh, is, is a map of the um, borders of the Jewish state in blue, the Arab state in um, orange or ochre or yellow, and Jerusalem in white. As you may now, the, as, you, as, you may, as you may of course know, the, the state of Israel at least claims uh, sovereignty or partial responsibility, uh, partial um, sovereignty uh, over a much larger area, including of course everything that's within the borders here. Um, so the issue of borders is a major issue in the in the uh, in the resolution 181 of November 1947. The Arab community as a whole, Arab states and the Arab community of what would later be Israel, rejected the um, the uh, resolution 181, which is the, is is now called the partition plan. Uh, plan for the partition of Palestine, etc. Um, the Arab community rejected it. The Jewish community, by and large, accepted it. Um, but a major, um, a, a, a major uh, uh, influence on the later events um, um, is the attitude of Great Britain. Not many know at least among the, uh, my, my colleagues, uh, my Israeli colleagues, that, that the main reason why the partition plan, I will now call it the partition, the main reason why the partition plan did not materialize, and I say it was not materialized, whatever we, both in the declaration and 
now politically say the partition plan was, has not been materialized. Israel is not a materialization, even part materialization, of the uh, partition plan. This is a political issue. I will not go in, in length into it, except for the issue of borders. Now, Britain rejected it, and um, the immediate, immediate effect of this rejection was that taking into consideration the fact that Great Britain was in actual charge of the uh, area here. They, it, it is the, the um, oppos opposition of Great Britain to even the presence of representatives of the United Nations who were supposed to start the process of um, putting in force the partition plan, the opposition of England was the main reason why the partition plan never took off. The idea was the UN would, and they did, uh, nominate a committee of five, a, an executive committee, a UN executive committee for Palestine. The idea was that the committee should um, come here in the, uh, to the area, they would, the committee would um, take powers, gradually take powers from Great Britain, from the mandatory power, and slowly transfer that power to the three entities that were, that were envisaged. Now, the, the Brits didn't even allow the committee to be present in uh, any part of what we now call Israel. And therefore, the, the partition plan never took off. OK, now um, let me jump to an event that I think uh, is um, relevant to the issue that I have just raised about the connection, the link between uh, Resolution 181 and the existence of the state of I the very existence of the state <laughs> of Israel or at least the borders of the state of Israel. What you see here is the letter of request by the then representative <laughs> of the very, very new state of Israel and our one hour, how do you call it? Batri. The state of Israel uh, existed for an hour, an hour old, an hour old state of Israel. This is um, this is a uh, this is a text of the request by the so-called ambassador of the one hour old state of Israel. Request uh, um, requesting. <laughs> the recognition of the state of Israel by the American president, the United States president at the time, Harry Truman. So Ambassador Epstein, Israel is, some Israelis know him by his later name, Eilat. Eliyahu Epstein, the ambassador of the <laughs> hour long state of Israel, request recognition of the state of Israel from the US government. Many say that without this recognition, the establishment of the state would have at least been postponed. Some say that without that recognition, that immediate recognition, uh, there could perhaps not be a state of Israel. Something else perhaps, but not the state of Israel as we know it. I know it's controversial, but the claim can be made. Anyhow, an hour after the Israel is declared independent <coughs> in Tel Aviv, Remember, eight hours different difference between Washington and Tel Aviv. So it's morning in, it's late afternoon in Tel Aviv, but mid-morning in Washington. So 11 o'clock Washington time, Ambassador Epstein makes this request. I have the honor to um, notify you that the state of Israel has been proclaimed as an independent <gasps> republic. My colleagues, um, 
get all excited about, uh, about the question whether Israel was declared a Jewish and democratic state. And here, Ambassador Epstein uh, calls Israel a republic. Where did he <laughs> get this from? The independent republic within the frontiers approved by the General Assembly of the United Nations Nations in its resolution of November 29. So what he is actually requesting is recognition of the small state, the partition state, as approved by the United Nations. Now, as a lawyer, I would tell you, when you uh, make a request and the request is approved, then it is approved on the terms of the request, right? You say, I want an apartment. May I have, an, uh, may I have this apartment for 50,000 or 50 million? And the guy says, yes, then it's 50 million. So we got a recognition of the partition plan by the United by the United States. Now, truth is, when the state of Israel was declared in Tel Aviv an hour earlier, <coughs> any commitment to frontiers was erased, not just not present, but erased by government decision. All right? So is Epstein lying? Well, he could, right? It would ev even <laughs> have made sense, right? Uh, in a moment, I'll explain why it was important. And if he lied, I don't think that even God would have been very angry with him. But he did not lie. He just did not know. He did not know. He was absolutely certain. He was absolutely sure that the state of Israel was declared an hour earlier within the partition borders. How this, this, how this, this happen? It happened because of these gentlemen you see here uh, in the uniform of the International Court of Justice, the one that we now hate in Israel, <laughs> the International Court of Justice in The Hague, not, not really true, this is a civil Court of Justice, not the Criminal Court of Justice that <laughs> they now have in The Hague. His name is Hirsch Lauterpacht, or Lauterpacht, if you, um, if you pronounce it in the, in the original language. Hirsch Lauterpacht was the most prominent international lawyer at the time. Hirsch Lauterpacht was the most prominent international lawyer at the time. He was born in the Ukraine, moved to Vienna, um, achieved great success in Vienna under a great philosopher and lawyer, Hans Kelsen, but had to flee Vienna because ant anti-Semitism found Hirsch Lauterpacht, <laughs> found refuge in England, became the most prominent professor of international law in Cambridge, and from there, from Cambridge, became the most prominent international lawyer in the world. Now, Hirsch Lauterpacht was Jewish. In his youth, he was a Zionist, an ardent Zionist. Even he was an active Zionist. But after events in Vienna, he decided, perhaps for his own career, he, did that, he never changed his mind, to actually conceal his Zionist um, <coughs> feelings. And very few knew in England or in anywhere that he was even Jewish, but very few, very few knew that he still harbored some Zionist affiliations, feelings. Let me also say, just as a matter of gossip, he was related to some of the most prominent <coughs> members of the future government. He was the uncle of, some of you may know, Abba Iban, Aubrey Iban, later uh, ambassador to United, uh, Israeli ambassador to United States. Now, so Lauterpacht, I needed to tell this piece, piece of gossip because otherwise, why would Lauterpacht do anything about the establishment of the state of Israel? He is high, he's concealing his Zionist affiliations, he's uh, nurturing an international career, he is doing business in Saudi Arabia for the great oil companies. What's his interest in 
the uh, state of Israel. Well, he's Jewish, he has relatives, his wife is from Mozart, not from, no, we are not in Jerusalem. Far from here, Mozart is a small village near Jerusalem. Uh, he, he, he raises his son, Eli, not Eli, as some say, Eli Lauterfahrt, his son. He raises him on a Hebrew language. So when Abba Ibn asks him in Waldorf Astoria over a coffee or something, perhaps more strong, stronger, uh, to write, to draft a declaration of independence for the state of Israel, Hersch Lauterpacht obliges and, and wastes or spends the next two nights scri scribbling. I happen to have the manuscript. Um, do I have a copy here? No. Uh, a declaration of independence for the state of Israel. He gets it printed and he um, submits his text of, the declara of a declaration of independence for the Republic of Israel. That was his idea of what the state should be. Not democratic, but republic. You I think there is a difference. <laughs> A democracy is about individual rights and it's instrumental. It's a, an instrument for the bitui. Ah, my English is gone. Expression of, 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 of private individuals. A, re a republic is a balance between rights of the individual and duties of the individual and it's different. It's in it's in philosophy, he probably got it from his, his, his mentor, Hans Kelsen, the difference between republicanism and democracy, and perhaps, uh, yeah, and um, there are even two parties, major parties in America, and, and they know the difference between republicanism and democracy, so it's not, it's not, all right, just, Hersch Lauterpacht wants a republic. But more, 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 uh, more importantly, Hersch Lauterpacht assumes, he, do, doesn't, he, he doesn't even cross his, he does not even cross his mind the possibility that after this huge achievement of future recognition by the United States, by the United Nations of at least the right of a Jewish state to exist in Palestine, in Eretz Israel, Lauterpacht is so excited about this, like perhaps the majority of the, of the Jewish people in the world, that he just takes it for granted that the state of Israel will be declared, he did not know the name, that the Jewish Republic will be declared within the frontiers of, uh, of uh, um, approved by, by the United Nations within partition, partition uh, uh, borders. Um, but let me see if I can enlarge this. <laughs> well, Lauterpacht submits his text to the Jewish diplomats of future Israel. Epstein is one of them. Another name is Moshe Den Shertok, later Moshe Sharet, who would later become uh, the um, Minister of Foreign Affairs and even for a while, tragic, uh, uh, tragically a, a, a prime minister. Um, and the whole legal and diplomatic community, both Israeli and Jewish, there were Jewish American lawyers and diplomats who took part in, in this whole effort to first establish the state of Israel and then get a cognition of it. But they, are, they sit in America, in Washington and New York, and the reality happens in Tel Aviv. Now, the whole community of both Israeli and Jewish um, activists in America assumes, takes it for granted that if Hersch Lauterpacht uh, um, drafted a declaration of independence for the state of Israel, then they all assumed that when the state was declared, four o'clock in the afternoon, Friday, 14th of May, 1948, they all in Washington assumed that the state was declared on the text of Lauterpacht. 
Now, there are telegrams going back and forth between Washington, New York, and Tel Aviv, but neither side even bothers to, to raise questions about the text itself. In Tel Aviv, they assume that they are in Tel Aviv responsible for drafting a declaration of independence. In Washington, they assume they have one, and they talk about absolutely everything possible mainly about ammunition and, f and financing of ammunition for the state of Israel, other issues of political and diplomatic issues like the, an armity, armistice plan that is in the, in the planning, like the trusteeship plan that is in the planning. They, they communicate with each other, Ben-Gurion and his team here, and shall talk back in, 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 in Washington, but not about the text of the declaration. Therefore, miraculously, I can only say miraculously, those of you who, who believe in, in um, divine providence, perhaps there was an intervention there, Epstein is totally innocent in, may, in, 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 in assuming that the text used is Lauterbach's te uh, text. Now what I, what I show here is, is that on the 10th of May 1948, they draft submitted for discussion to the executive political leadership back in Tel Aviv. 10th of May, there is still a commitment to borders approved by the UN. What I, what I mean to say here is that even in Tel Aviv, until a few days before the actual declaration, the assumption is that the state will be declared within the borders approved by the UN. What happens is that in a, a in, in the, f not really the final, but I'll call it the final, the final meeting of the executive, the political leadership, they decided by majority vote, just five, to four majority vote not to commit to the borders. And this is how the state of Israel has been declared. And the state of Israel, some of you may know, uh, has never declared any borders to this state. It's probably the only, maybe one, one, one state, perhaps in the uh, one island in the, in the Pacific Ocean that has uh, natural borders. My, we are the only state in the world that has never declared borders. It's a political issue. No government ever dared to touch the issue, so we have no borders. But it all started from uh, a controversy arising out of the, 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 the um, uh, formation of the state at this stage, ending up in the actual text of the declaration. Now, let me uh, show you. Um, Very quickly, let me show you the actual beginning of the drafting of the Declaration of Independence. Again, not actual, not actual points, but they, um, what I think is, imp is could be interesting to um, to, the, the com to, uh, to our guests, the fact that the actual drafting of the Declaration of, of Independence starts with a meticulous copying out, handwritten copying out of the American Declaration of Independence. Very quickly, here is a gentleman. He, uh, this, this is his picture in later life. His name is Mordechai Beham, but like everybody in Israel, you will forget the name in no more than 30 seconds from now. Nobody remembers his name. Mordechai Beham, last time you hear the name. Um, is a small, small, small lawyer, um, non-distinct private lawyer in Tel Aviv. In the weeks before the declaration, everybody else is doing something important. Mordechai, oh, the third time, Mordechai Beham has not much to do. He is a small <laughs> private lawyer. Now fate um, casts him, casts him, in a historic, in a historic role, 
he is asked by the future minister of justice, a person called now, later called Pinchas Ozen, I'll use the, new, the Hebrew name for him. Pinchas Ozen, the future minister of justice, needs some assistance in what he assumes is, is the legal department's task to produce a, a declaration of independence. He finds Mordechai Beham and asks him, actually com commands him, to <laughs> draft a declaration of independence. What would you or any of your students do at this when, when you are faced with this enormous, enormous task? Right? You find somewhere to copy from. You either uh, work by your fellow students or anyhow. Mordechai Beham goes to the library of a rich, sure, goes to the library. It's a Sabbath, uh, it's a Saturday, 24th of April, 1948. Mordechai Beham is clueless. He is desperate, he, he starts crying over Passover lunch. It's a big no-no, you don't cry over Passover lunch. So his family asks what the matter was. Beham is probably the only person who takes seriously the vow of secrecy he makes not to tell that a, a state is about to be declared. So he does not tell, and he just leaves the lunch, goes over to the library of a rich American rabbi, one of the only persons who back in 48 had a, 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 a meaningful library, private library. Public libraries are not open, even then on a Saturday, on a Sabbath day. So Mordechai Beham goes to the library of Rabbi Davidovitz across the street, and starts looking for sources. So he copies out, you see it here, he copies out verbatim the American Declaration of Independence. Even then, at that moment, he starts making decisions because unlike today where when we have not even Xerox machines, we have internet, right? When you copy out by hand, you, may, you need to, to choose out the parts that are relevant from the parts that are not relevant. So he starts making decisions about the Declaration of Independence of Israel weeks before the Declaration is made. He has to make those choices by choosing out parts of the American Declaration of Independence he assumed could possibly be relevant for the formation of the State of Israel. See, this is how he starts. Then he sits <coughs> at home, he goes home, using the same kind of paper, thin paper we used to use for air letters, very thin paper. Uh, and he starts editing out the American pieces of text, editing them into, adapting them to what he assumes should be the identity of the state. And he now has to tackle questions like, if the Americans say, and I'll finish in a moment on this, if the Americans say, we therefore, remember the American Declaration of Independence make a list of justification why they rebel against the king of England of the, of the time, and then we, they come to the, what I call the Declaration, the Speech Act, we therefore, they don't even know at the time that they are Americans. They'll have to wait for the Constitution of the United States to say, we the American people. They don't know that they are a people back in 1976. So we, they say strange things like, we the people, small p, not capital P, of the colonies. They use the language of the oppressor. All right? They have issues with their own identity. Aha, uh -huh, but not Mordechai Beham, because unlike the American Americans, we have a people. So he starts, he, he crosses out the good people of the colonies, and he writes, we, the Jewish people. But then he starts thinking, and this is the only, only issue of terminology <laughs> that I, I, I hope to raise, um, raise today. 
Because what he asks himself is a question that unfortunately we Israelis don't ask anymore. Are all the Jews of the world, are the, is the entirety of the Jewish people both responsible and okay, responsible for the creation of the state of Israel? Well, truth is some Jews don't care. Many others care but oppose the existence of the state of Israel. Many others were supportive of the state of Israel. Beham creates a, a solution that is, I think, still relevant today, but my own generation does not realize it anymore. He actually partitioned the Jewish people into two and created what I call the double parenthood of the state of Israel. He said, <laughs> we, the Jewish community of Israel, here is my problem of translation, Hayeshuv Hayehudi, the Jewish community of Israel, by which he means Jews who actually made the act for whatever reason, the act of settling in Israel, being in Israel. And in this he included the Haredim, the anti-Zionists. His idea was even a non-Zionist Jew, by being in Israel, by choosing to be in Israel, is responsible for the creation of the state. So this is one community. He says, we, Hayeshuva Yehudi, the Jewish community, or Jewish settlement, but this is too political, the Jewish community of Israel, of the land of Israel, the Jews who are here, one, but then he says, and the Zionist movement, who is we, who established the state of Israel? It's a combination, it's a partnership of two distinct parts <laughs> of the Jewish people, not the entire Jewish people. Jews who live outside of Israel, choose to live outside of Israel, but are Zionists, choose to be Zionists by an act of putting both a shekel in a, in a, in, in a box, okay? making an organizational uh, um, choice to support the, uh, the idea of uh, political um, akshama, fulfillment, fulfillment of, the, of, of, of the Zionist dream, uh, but different from other Jews. So this is one, just one example. Beham makes decisions all along, <laughs> and his blueprint is actually the main um, is responsible for almost all <coughs> aspects of the final declaration. Now, words will keep changing. From Beham, a process starts that has like <coughs> 15 or 16 stages of drafting. The, the drafts change hands, pass through very different, very different um, first lawyers, then political leaders. Every word is discussed, but Beham sets the tone. My final point is this. He takes from the Declaration, the American Declaration of Independence, the idea that is not self-evident, and that is that a, a people that declares independence needs to justify. This is controversial. This is not self-evident. Justification, some say, is weakness. When you talk too much, like me, when you justify too much, you show weakness. Perhaps it is better to just declare a state and request the world to recognize it. That's it, right? Talking too much, Beham takes from the American Declaration. I don't know if you know, but the American Declaration is much, much longer than most of you know. It's not only the first paragraph. It's a huge, tiring uh, text making um, all sorts of accusations against the King of England, raping our women and, and, and disrespecting our dollar and our post offices, etc., etc. It's a long, 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 long text. Beham takes the idea. <coughs> From there, I know that many would not, that even this claim is, is controversial and we may discuss it in a moment, but Beham takes the idea that he, has to ne he needs to justify. Other justifications will take over Beham's justifications, but the idea that it has to be an epic text 
a story of a people leading to a speech act and then making promises for the future, a bit like the American Declaration of Independence, hmm? making statements about the, the future character of the state, <coughs> not yet a constitution, exactly as in America, not yet a constitution. It, it took the Americans a while to create a formal uh, 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 constitution, but the, the basic form, the basic aspirations of Americans in creating this at least federation of states is in the in the in the uh, in their original declaration of independence so Beham is responsible the anonymous Beham is responsible for m much if not most of the aspects of the israeli declaration of independence all right th so that's my part if if you are thank questions. you so much thank you And excuse my English, I assume that I remembered my English, but sorry, okay. No, it's, oh, it's been wonderful I mean listening it. to you. You said that you talk too much, but uh, we could have spent the next half hour at least uh, listening to you, but we, we the people of the Ben-Gurion <laughs> ben Institute, Institute, have questions for okay. you, <laughs> and lots of questions I see. May I suggest, I have questions and comments myself, but I... I'll perhaps share them later. Uh, may I suggest that uh, students also, we, I mean, it's tailored for the students. I see Ilan and, and Nathan and Arye. Um, but if there are any students who would like to make a comment or ask a question, uh, let me please know. Otherwise, um, Ilan, uh, we take three, sure. three rounds. Uh, Ilan, you'd be the first. Uh, we are all students. All students. Uh, um, and you are an international student. That's true. Um, but I'm an Israeli international student. That's true as well. Uh, I wonder, uh, this is wonderful stuff. This Thank is you. a document that fascinates. Uh, uh, just a qu not a question, but just a statement that is not well known. In 1986, when I was director of this institute, I was charged with being involved in the uh, uh, ben Gurion centenary, and it, Merkaz Hashkalah was selected out of the spring, and wanted to have the people of Israel sign the document again. And we learned within one week that we could not get the people of Israel to sign on again. And the problem was the first paragraph, because it ascribed um, the authority for creating the Book of Books, which is an interesting abbreviation, to the people, <laughs> those people, rather than to Mount Sinai. Yeah. And so we gave up after a week. The whole notion was we learned how to do it of having people reaffirm their vows. It wouldn't happen. Um, but more to the point, your, your stories pass wonderfully in terms of individuals like Mr. Behan. But in fact, they really didn't have a choice, did they? In terms of for forming it like they did, A, they needed to have justification. For the previous 30 years, they had been making arguments, making reforms about the justifications for having a Jewish state within Palestine. And uh, the arguments that they developed are actually the arguments that were used time and time again in helping their international forms. And Americans also had to justify, as you know from Martin Luther, being a, a revolutionary and hanging free people in the wall is a, is a very dramatic act. And you can't do it unless you justify. And the American Declaration is the first, but it has many problems, and particularly in contested states. And so actually, perhaps the PLO and the Hamas have their documents as well. They have to define <coughs> who they are. <coughs> American Declaration of Independence makes it just self-evident. You don't agree with anything that I said. The Americans said, well, th this is just manifestly true. You can take it or leave it. We did the same thing. Um, and, and so that, that model goes beyond an individual 
Iran is going to see its political culture that had developed over several decades and embraced in the decline of the universal culture. So this is merely a question through the kind of comment yeah. that I'd like you to react to. To what extent is there something very particular here? And to what extent can this be something actually quite universal in the post-World War II period for all kinds of states and republicans? Republic of Asia mm -hmm. Thank you, Ilan. Just briefly, I may add that the Palestinian Declaration of Statehood that you mentioned in 88 mm -hmm. actually takes lots of examples from, no, no, from the Israeli one. So the Israelis right. went to the Americans, the Palestinian went to the Israelis. Natan. the right and duty that was they were losing in charge and the irony was that they won they didn't control the middle the united states <coughs> had the right well recognized rule of the state where you are now on the 14th of may not where you're going to be in the end of october 1941 and the other thing about the iraq that i happen to be very fortunate to organize with our you had six drafts of the letter in the train. Left it with Clark City, and then rang him up to tell him which draft to hand to Harry Truman. And they were very different. One was the Battle Republic, another one had the word democracy in it, and another one um, was very different. So no one actually knew what was going to happen. There were 11 minutes past midnight. What do you think of my question? <laughs> 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 he thinks highly of it. Uh, Ariel. Um, two questions. Well, thank you for giving us the answer. Um, let me just do a quick one with, with, with a follow up with Nathan on Nathan's question on this issue of the identity of the state. I mean, you, you mentioned that that was an important concern for Gordon, but we also see in the EPA some hints of the fact that Egypt doesn't just have a character of the state. Uh, so you have in some formulations the republic, and you can argue about the difference between republic and democracy. Uh, I noted that in one of the versions, at around the same time, in one of your slides, we have republic in English and in Hindi, we have Yudit Pasid um, Ribonit, which is not exactly the same thing, right? Um, so <coughs> if you can maybe, basically I wanna, I wanna ask you to elaborate on the process and how do we reach the point doesn't really declare the character of the state, the own set of states. And then another question which just combines <coughs> the, uh, the historical aspect and the contemporary aspect is, it has to do in a way with, with how do we understand this document in a way, right? Because as you point out, um, maybe it, 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 it talks too much, you say, right? Because uh, it doesn't, uh, the, the, the drafters of this document are not satisfied with the way we read the document. Um, but it does much more than that, right? As you pointed out, the actual graphic aspects of it, but it, it's a nation building document in right. cultural respects and, and constructing vaults of memory, in fact, even. Um, and so maybe elaborate a little bit on this, but, uh, but actually, the question I want to ask you, uh, both historically and contemporary, in what sense should we see this document as a legal document? Like, does it form? in the eyes of its drafters and in the, at least in your view of our contemporary discourse in Israel today, does it create a legal basis for the legal, uh, the legal structure of the state? Mm -hmm. where, sh where shall I begin? Uh, perhaps from the end. Um, I don't think it, it has any legal um, standing, it's not a constitution, that, that's well known. Um, but again, question is how, how many details? Um, 
It's not even a law. Ben-Gurion um, achieved consensus by um, pretending to present the discussion, the debate, um, by the sovereign political body of the time, the, the People's Council, Mo'etzetaam, he pretended to, to achieve the consensus by <laughs> opening their noon meeting, noon, just a few hours before the actual declaration, their only meeting since their creation. Ben-Gurion ben was responsible for that. He did not convene the People's Council for weeks before the declaration, only convened them a few hours before the declaration, started out, now, now I'm going legal, started out by declaring that this is a first reading using the parliamentary uh, formal um, form of decision making, three, three stages of the creation. So I said, uh, I hereby present the text for a first reading, and I want to know what you think of it. Any amendments will be considered. Now he wastes half an hour, full half an hour, reading out a text. This is perhaps why it's so long. Nah, I'm joking that time. Uh, he wastes half an hour on this. Now it's what? It's 1.30, 4 o'clock the, the ceremony must begin. Now he gives an opportunity to the two main political um, communities, uh, <laughs> parties, who did not participate until that moment. And I think I know the reason why he gave them the right, the, the, the right to uh, participate. Hint, they both talked too much. One was Mr. Vilner. He stood up, he, he, he was a, a representative of the Communist Party at the time, very Stalinist. So he stood up and wasted another half an hour on, on, on Papa Stalin and on world, uh, world uh, what do you call it? Uh, then wrote Mr. Vardy, later Mr. Rosenblum, before also Mr. Rosenblum for the revisionist, and he made a Jabotinsky speech on, on uh, Steger Dotla Yarden and management that went. They <coughs> both are opposed to almost every aspect and demand many amendments, right? The revisionist mainly demand a constitutional content, right? Exact, oh, exactly opposite than, the, 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 than the, their political stand now. They wanted freedom of speech. They wanted commitment to freedom of association, freedom of, of assembly, separation of church and state. Ben-Gurion ben listened to them all, and he said, time is out. We need the taxi is waiting. Bye-bye. I'll let you make your request for amendments on Sunday, right? So they go to the, to the museum, the, the declaration is made, some of them signed, not all of them, because some of them, God forbid, were still abroad, some of them were stuck in Jerusalem, all right? But some of them signed, all right? Come Sunday, Ben-Gurion wastes a whole day on issues, great issues of economy and political, and of course, security. By evening, he says, all right, now your comments. And the guy, the, the, the uh, members, now they are called Mo'etzet Amazmani, the Provisional Council of State, not the People's Co Council. And they, um, so they say, what do you mean comments? You promised amendments. <coughs> ben Gurion says, comments, please. They each make comments. Now, Aguda Tisrael, the ultra Orthodox, made their comments and say exactly what they feel then and now. That is, if it is not Medinat al if it is not, a, a, uh, if it is not, if it is not ruled by by uh, Jewish law, then there is no point. We are not part of it. Ben Gurion said, "Thank you," and closes. The, and that, that is the end of it. So it is not even a law. It pretended to be a law, and it is not even a law. 
But whether or not it's a moral credo, I believe it is, but the uh, legal standing of it is very, very weak, perhaps non-existent. If it is made, if it is adopted as, uh, as some uh, wish, I don't think it's realistic. It is, if it becomes a, f a, a part of a, con of a future constitution, then so be it. But, but now I, 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 don't, I, I don't have it. Uh, did, they have to, <coughs> did they have to justify? Was it, uh, well, there was one option that was used by different draftsmen, draftspersons. One of them, um, um, what's his name? Lauterpacht himself, but also a, a name now almost forgotten, a person called Leo Cohen. Leo Cohen drafted the draft constitution for the state of Israel. Ireland. He assumed, he hmm? Ireland. <coughs> of Ireland, yes. No, no, he commented on the constitution of Ireland, but all right. So Leo Cohen um, drafted a, a, a draft constitution for the state of Israel at the time January 48, he assumed that, that the partition plan will materialize so that by October 1st, 1948, two events will collate, will come together. One, the, uh, the Declaration of Independent State, and two, a constitution, a full-fledged constitution. That was the idea, right? So, so he writes a preamble to the constitution that is supposed to serve as a as a um, as a declaration of independence. This is this is the connection of Leo Cohen. Now both <coughs> Leo Cohen and Lauterpacht uh, come out with the following idea. If it if you we need to justify what they say is this: write a short, festive but very short piece of paper, not as short as the one the legal <coughs> one that I mentioned. Um, the state of Israel is declared and let the world recognize it a bit longer. But then they added, both Leo Cohen and Lauterpacht, added a legal, a full legal docu document of justification. Their idea was the speech act needed to be concise, festive but concise. And if a legal document was necessary, they <coughs> added it. So both of them added a long, long text of, ju of legal justification. Leo Cohen was also an international lawyer. So, they, uh, the, so, so th this is one, one option that uh, it could be used. Uh, and, and the other point is this. Um, within the executive, in those two days before the Declaration of Independence, at least four members of a very small executive, nine members of the executive, four members of the executive kept <coughs> actually screaming out, what's the purpose of this long document? Why are you justifying it so much? It's enough to say, and this is, this is the thought, one member of a left-wing party called Hachomer Atzair at the time, Mapam, one member, actually came out with the, what I think is the main paragraph, the most important paragraph in the Declaration of Independence that is attributed wrongly to David Ben-Gurion. He just used the idea. What the good Mr. Bentov from Mapam said in that uh, meeting was, we don't need anything other than the natural right. We are a people. People have the right to a state. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Self uh, uh, Actually, natural right. self, self, <coughs> the natural right to self <laughs> self admiration. Thank you again. We have the right. We are a people. I mean, is this controversial? If there is, if there is a people in the world, an organic people, we are that people. We are a normal people, and we have the right to self determination, namely to a state. That's all you need to say. Bentov kept saying, "You don't need a, a whole story." of 6,000 years of Jewish suffering and, uh, and a good Mr. Balfour, who may have or may have not, or may have, a, or Mr. McMahon, who may have, uh, who, who may have <laughs> issued a, 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 a another letter and uh, this, uh, um, <coughs> uh, um, the, 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 the resolution of the United States. Bentov said, just 
say yeah. this is our natural right. Uh, so what I, what I, so it is not self-evident. I think that a long, long uh, text of justification is necessary. <laughs> now about about uh, the, um, the issue of how how we, how are we actually in charge? Well, um, actually, if you read the Hebrew text, uh, there is a there is a claim that's that's almost concealed there in the second paragraph, which says we are in charge. It it was this was drafted by Moshe Shatok, who was himself a diplomat and, and, and a lawyer, and to um, to close the circle. He, in this, is a student of Hersch Lauterpacht. Hersch Lauterpacht wrote in 1947, to the surprise of everybody around him, a book on recognition of states. You see how actually Zionist he was. He produced a book using his huge fame at the time. He uh, wrote a book, he published a book on recognition of states. Now, contrary to his claim to fame that was anti-nationalistic, that was universalist, that was globalist, that was for, he, he, Lauterpacht made his career on anti-nationalist sentiment. This is how he was recognized by the entire community. All of a sudden in 1947, uh, Lauterpacht writes a book and he says, the only thing that matters is power. Whoever is in charge, Regardless of justifications, whoever is in actual charge, actual control, he said, actual control, whoever is in actual control of an area is the, is the lawful uh, <laughs> sovereign um, entitled to recognition by the community of nations. Unbelievable, all right? So Moshe Shatok is using this, uh, use, use, using this, uh, this argument, this claim, now, whether or not we were in actual charge, <laughs> this is a very different. This is a very different question. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not a military historian. I'm. I'm not a historian of any. <laughs> I'm just a lawyer. But um, so, but whether or not we were actually in charge, I don't know. But the claim that we are in charge was very important, both legally and uh, and morally. And it, it uh, and it is part of the of the de actual declaration. Uh, we so have we have less yeah. than ten minutes and All a right. few more questions. So with Good. your permission, yeah. uh, Avi and Paula and and Jonathan, are there any more questions? I will. I, I, I don't have. We don't have enough time. So I don't know. No, if we, we can do it. And I um, mean, we. Okay, Avi. You can start, Avi. said that the, the Jewish state of Israel won't, wouldn't be de declared uh, without American consent? Well, if that's what you are saying, I think it's the, the, it's the opposite around. The, the, the declaration was uh, the, 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 uh, Israel declared a, a state in a defiance uh, uh, to uh, an American ultimatum laid down by uh, <laughs> uh, Secretary of State uh, Marshall. Marshall. This is the, the maybe they got some approval some uh, from from uh, from Clifford and other uh, other guys in, in uh, the American uh, administration. Yes, but the the declaration was a is a was a defiance. That's one thing. Concerning republic, republic uh, by the term republic, you say nothing about the allocation of power. So the republic can be a democracy, the republic can be an olig oligarchy or, or, or whatever. I think by, 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 the, by I think that the, the Great Britain, is or the kingdom of Great Britain is also a republic because a republic essentially <coughs> is a polity that considers, considers itself as belong, as, as, as something that is belong, that, 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 that the uh, citizens own it. And, and uh, uh, th this is this goes <coughs> the same uh, on the term uh, democracy. Democracy can be either liberal or non-liberal. Non you, you have non-liberal democracy. So 
by the term republic, you know, uh, it began, uh, I think, uh, meant a, a, a polity that is belong that belongs to, 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 to its citizens. Uh, thirdly, he said, this is also, I, I, as far as I understood you, that the 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 the, the, the Britain was the main reason for 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 the for, for the UN not to fulfill the, the partition. <laughs> what about the the Arab? Uh, what, 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 what about the Arab position? I think it's a bit ma uh, more uh, important here. Uh, now I think uh, my fourth and uh, uh, remark is that. I think that the, the Israeli declaration is much shorter than the American one. Uh, maybe it has the same structure. I think you, not maybe, you're right. It has the same structure, and it's very, uh, and, uh, it's very interesting that, that, that this, this uh, connection, but it is shorter because, it, because its main function is an identity declaration. This is who we are, not only, not <coughs> maybe it's, it's a speech act of, uh, of uh, creating a state, but also, and, 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 and very importantly, a, a, a declaration of identity. And that, that's why, that's why it, it is shorter, and I think that's why it has a higher normative uh, uh, status than any other law more than even ma what we call basic laws, <laughs> which, are, which are part of our future constitution, because it defines who we are. So it, is, it should be a, a, a tool for a judicial review on, on, on the subject, uh, on, 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 on the terms whether this or that uh, uh, law uh, uh, is in accord with our basic identity. So that's why it's short. Uh, oh, where do just, I begin? Just right. uh, let's, okay, let's sure. take a question from okay. Jonathan. Jonathan um, okay. I have a, a short question myself. Jonathan. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. A couple of weeks ago, there was uh, Ben Gurion there, and uh, Yair Lapid uh, oh. had somewhat of a controversial speech, using the he referred to the to the independent state sure. of Israel document as saying that taking part of it and. and uh, the new uh, government and saying that they're not aligned with the, with the, um, with it. And it made me <coughs> wonder, first of all, uh, wh where does it uh, draw its actual validity and importance? Having seen that, you know, it was written like up to an hour, like it started to be written two weeks or something before the actual event, which is not long for su such an important uh, document. And um, and because it doesn't have a legal uh, um, validity to it, um, so w why is it so important? And having asked that, does it have a legal protection these days, and can it be changed legally? And what do you think? I mean, you know, Israel is so uh, young; uh, things are happening all the time. And I don't know. I'm not getting political here, but seeing what's going on. Uh, apropos uh, uh, Yair Lapid's speech, it, I mean, maybe the people, maybe the <coughs> this is a situation that, that was relevant to uh, 70 uh, years ago, but now maybe it has changed. So what do you think? It, can, it, can it be changed? And do you think it really? And, well, a, and okay. a brief uh, question <laughs> on my yeah, behalf. Okay. Uh, we don't have much time, so let me say it very briefly. Um, this book, this wonderful book sheds light on the drafting, <coughs> on the process of drafting, on the making of the declaration of the state of Israel. And as a historian, and you are a historian, it's a piece of history, uh, and a lawyer, sometimes, uh, even though uh, quite a lot of light is shed on documents, still we sense that there are dark areas we sense or we get a hint of the things that we do not know, the things that were silenced, the things that got lost uh, throughout this process. 
did you have the same experience here? Do you have a sense of, of, the, of the part of the story that is not told in the book, but had existence uh, uh, once in history? And uh, if, with your permission, let's take four or five minutes, no more than that fr from, from the break. Okay, but where do I begin? Uh, I stand corrected on, on, on the term republic, not important, but about, uh, about uh, United States recognition. Yes, Marshall opposed, but Truman supported. And the question is, what would have happened if Truman did not recognize? And the, my point is this. I, uh, Epstein was asked throughout that week, one, uh, starting from Monday, every day, three times a day, not only by Marshall's cronies, but by, you mentioned Clifford? But Clifford, Clifford uh, but not unmentioned. So, by, uh, by Truman's, uh, you Truman's, Truman's, uh, uh, Truman's aides, who were very supportive, three times a day, <laughs> are you committed to the, uh, the, that was actually Marshall's sort of condition to uh, Truman in their only meeting. Truman, Marshall said, whatever you say now, Truman, Truman said at the beginning of the week that he was not committed, Marshall said, you may say you're not committed. I know you are going to recognize, but there's one thing I want you to commit to and see that the, the, the Jews commit to, and that is that the petition. So Epstein is asked one again and again and again and again. Now, my of course it's a counterfactual, and this is why I'm not a formal historian, and we are not supposed to ask what would have happened if Napoleon was not stupid enough to re remain in Russia in the, in, in the winter. So, uh, counterfactual. So, but <laughs> the issue was so important to everybody around, uh, around Epstein, including the Jewish lawyers American that were kept out recognition on the conditions that were set out by even the supporters. Even, Cl even Clifford keeps asking at the last moment, ask, keep asking, keep, keeps asking uh, <laughs> Epstein, are you committed in the name of your government? Have you checked it? And he said, yes. I don't need to, yes, no, he did not say I don't need to check. He said yes. Would this have po at least postponed recognition? I think so. Uh, but we don't, it's a counterfactual. It's not a counterfactual. Well, we, it's not they, a counterfactual. They, 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 they discussed the American, uh, the American position. All right. Arab opposition, Arab opposition. If <laughs> Arab opposition is responsible for the fact that there is no Arab state. British uh, opposition is responsible for the fact that the state of Israel has very little to do with the UN declaration, with, with the UN resolution. That is my, that, that is my partial, partial answer. Uh, where else, what else? Um, Legal, I still insist it has no legal, no legal standing. What, if we change it, if anyone changes it, then they, they, they have to draw authority from whatever they, they do. But do we, do we need legal recognition for it to be an important, <laughs> important document? I don't know, I mean, um, m many Israelis uh, assume that the halakha is an important text it still has no legal standing. We don't have a fundamental law that says the halakha is the law of Israel. It's very important, it's inspirational. Um, much of the law of Israel is based on Jewish halakha, perhaps some would like more, but some of it. So the Declaration of Independence, I think, is inspirational and it's good enough. Now about, uh, the, uh, uh, about um, using, it in, uh, uh, using it in court, Again, I chose the name for my book exactly because I think some of the commitments in the Declaration of Independence, because of the iconic, now I'm closing the circle, because of the iconic form of it, I am, forgive my insolence, but I think most people just don't read it. There's, everybody knows about the Eretz Yisrael Kama Yudi, and there's the Lebechichach Et Asafnu Anu, and then Tzu Israel, the big, the big issue of Tzu Israel, and Belohed Eldad Gezer Zemin. I take the name of my book from a passage 
that I think is more important than any, any other. It explains that the state of Israel was formed to create a state where Jews can, be, can live in dignity, liberty, and honest toil. Honest toil? <coughs> Are we committed to honest toil? We don't have banks anymore. We don't have parasites. We don't have people make, making money from money as in the Jewish tradition. I'm being anti-Semitic now. <laughs> Are we Why the commitment to honest toil? Because uh, rather than having a clear view of what the state should be, they were not great lawyers, they were not constitutional lawyers, and they did not have much, much experience themselves as politicians in a, in a sovereign state. So whatever they wrote in the semi-constitutional uh, semi paragraph <coughs> is just copied out from the text of the US, uh, US uh, U United Nations re resolution, and only part of it, by the way. If we were committed to everything that the, the UN de de uh, demanded of us, then we would have, for, um, for instance, be committed to equality, not freedom of language, equality of language, which is now not only in our constitution, the opposite is now in our constitution because of Chok Yisod Om. All right? So the, 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 part, the constitutional part that is now, re now revered by my friends from the left, you may have guessed, I'm a lefty, oi pay. Okay, my they 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 don't really read what's in it, all right. So Banker Paulim would have gone down. All right, Banker Paulim. This is funny, no? Banker Paulim, <laughs> the Bank of Workers. All right. So what they knew, these guys who drafted the Declaration of Independence, what they they experienced was an image of diaspora the sense of being a diasporic Jew. So what they actually say, in my, to my mind, the most important part of it, is what they, what they express is a dream of a sovereign state where diaspora be negated. Kavot chenut v'amal yesharim, dignity, liberty, and honest toil. Even if it's, even if the feeling of the, the, what I call the diasporic feeling is an image of anti-Semitic view of, of what a Jew is. No <laughs> dignity, no freedom, right? No dignity, no freedom, and, 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 and no honest toil, yeah. right? So what, what I think they really know is why they emigrated to Israel. They wanted to be dignified here, they wanted to be free here, and they dreamed, at least that generation, about uh, about uh, honest toil. Everybody would be the raftanim, the, the, the cow milkers, and the and the, and the falachim from uh, from uh, the Ganya and, uh, and 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 Harod. Are we committed to this? Is this part of the of the constitution of the state of Israel that every any of us we are not honest laborers? We don't milk cows. We just talk. So. Uh, are you committed to the to the Declaration of Independence? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure that you. Uh, that, that, okay, sorry. I'm, I talk too much. <laughs> you talk too much, but you talk so well. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, you're brilliant. Thank you.